I want to thank you and Rafa for giving me the chance to join in this excellent uh, structured webinars. Um, uh, there's uh, my, a comment saying which says that necessity is the mother of all uh, inventions. And actually, I do believe in this comment saying because definitely our futures are always based on our needs and demands. And so I'll raise this uh, common saying as the slogan of my lecture today, uh, the recent updates in mammography uh, technique. According to the WHO, cancers are divided into 40% which can be prevented, 40% which can be cured if early detected, and 20% will only take the chance of palliative treatment. And if we look at breast cancer, we will find that it falls in between the last two groups, where if the patient is early detected, the patient can take the full chance of cure, and if lately detected, the patient will, all, will only take the chance of palliative uh, treatment. And it was found that the only way to curtail breast cancer is by coupling early detection together with a proper diagnosis in order to be able to give the patients the most adequate and appropriate treatment options. And of course, we as radiologists play a fundamental role in this part. And when preparing to fight the war against breast cancer, mammography was and still remains the first line defense. In spite of this, the technical advances in mammography lagged behind other imaging modalities. And the reason for this is that mammography has special requirements of quality standards that was thought that digital imaging could not supply. Yet after the introduction of the hospital information system, the PAC system, the film departments and the teleradiography, it has become essential to move one step forward, and because necessity is the mother of all inventions, a new weapon was added in the war against breast cancer, and this weapon was the full-field digital mammography, which was approved for sale by the Food and Drug Administration in the year 2000. Uh, and this is one example which shows you the difference between the conventional mammograms and the digital mammograms. It's hard to believe that these two mammograms be belong to the same lady just because she performed this mammogram on a conventional machine and the other one on the digital machine. And in spite of the advances uh, uh, that uh, digital mammography has added to the conventional mammography, yet it was always accused of having technical limitations. It was always accused of having a low sensitivity because the normal breast tissues may obscure an abnormality, and this is responsible for a large number of false negative results. It's also accused of having a low specificity because the superimposed breast tissues might give the impression of a false abnormality, and this is responsible for a large number of false positive results. And these limitations are even more whenever we have younger individuals, whenever we have dense or heterogeneous breast parenchyma, whenever we have non-distorting and non-calcified carcinomas, and sometimes it's not because of the lesions or the breast parenchyma, but because of the radiologist's bad perception and misinterpretation. Uh, this is uh, an example of uh, one of the worst types of breast that you can encounter on a mammogram. It's a heterogeneously dense breast classified as ACRD, and in spite that it, we can easily see multiple carcinomas in the left breast on the ultrasound, it is very difficult to pinpoint where these uh, multicentric carcinomas are within uh, the breast. Uh, this is another case again. She's a, she has a heterogeneous dense breast parenchyma, and in this breast, we see multiple partially obscured mass lesions. On her ultrasound examination underlying these lesions, there was fibrocystic mammary changes, but unfortunately, on screening, scanning the right breast, we saw this irregular hypoechoic mass lesion. It was present here all the time, but it was masked because of the dense heterogeneous breast parenchyma. Uh, actually, these limitations were the driving force behind efforts to refine existing mammography technologies and develop newer ones offering improved detection of breast cancer. The modalities which are affordable, fast, and in the same time applicable. And again, because necessity is the mother of all inventions, a new weapon had to be added in the war against breast cancer. And this time it was the 3D digital tomosynthesis, which was approved for sale by the Food and Drug Administration in 2011. A 3D digital tomosynthesis is expected to resolve many of the tissue overlap reading problems that are considered a major technical limitation of digital mammography. 
The technique of 3D digital tomosynthesis is exactly like the mammogram where the breast is placed here in between the compression plate and the digital detector. But what's different from a mammogram is that the X-ray tube moves in an arc across the breast, taking a series of low dose images that are acquired at different angles with a total dose that is similar to or slightly higher than a single view breast mammogram. Uh, the end result is that we have a reconstructed 3D image that can be viewed every one uh, millimeter. Uh, although the amount of exposure remains well below FDA permissible limits, yet the combination of digital mammography and digital breast tomosynthesis exposes patients to approximately two times the radiation dose of the digital mammography alone if done individually. And thus, uh, this is uh, uh, because of this, uh, we had to address the dose concerns. Uh, and the FDA has approved the use of a using the synthesized 2D image or the S view that are generated from the 3D data set. Uh, combining the individual optimally enhanced one millimeter slices, we can get a single synthetic view, uh, which looks exactly like the 2D mammogram. Uh, to, to understand how tomosynthesis works, we can imagine that we have such a breast with multiple lesions in the breast for example, microcalcification, a radiating mass lesion, and then speculated mass lesion. If you do a 2D mammogram, the three lesions will overlap each other, and it will be very difficult to characterize each lesion individually. Well, if we perform tomosynthesis and going through the slices, a slice will pass through the uh, microcalcification, the second slice through this radiating lesion, and the third slice through the uh, speculated mass lesion, and each individual lesion can be viewed excellently and we can characterize the margins and the shape of each lesions individually. Uh, one thing that we should do while viewing the tomosynthesis is that we should look at all the tomosynthesis cuts uh, carefully. And then we go back to the cuts where the lesions are, are more evident in order to identify the actual extension and to characterize uh, the lesion. Uh, the quality of the 3D tomosynthesis images depends on the X-ray dose, on the number of projections or exposures, and on the acquisition angle. Uh, we will find that we have machines which use a standard mode or a narrow angle mode with a few exposures. Actually, using this mode is, it allows us to make a fast examination with no motion artifacts, but the, the images are of a lower uh, quality. Uh, other machines might use a high resolution mode or a wide angle mode uh, with uh, many exposures. Uh, this technique is a slow technique which is liable to motion artifacts, but in the same times it gives us a higher image air quality. And we have machines like the Amulet in, uh, Innovality which uses which can combine uh, both uh, modes. Uh, the main use of tomosynthesis is in screening. Uh, because tomosynthesis helps us to detect more cancers and in the same time, it, we can uh, reduce the, the recall rates when using tomosynthesis. But it also has a, um, a role to play in the diagnostic context because it increases our diagnostic confidence, it reduces unnecessary biopsies, identifies the actual tumor size, and using tomosynthesis, we can identify multiplicity of lesions. And all this is more whenever we have the dense uh, breast parenchyma. Uh, we'll have a look on the tomosynthesis and its use in screening program. Uh, for example, we have this screening mammogram, which is again one of the worst types of breast, which can be classified as an AC uh, as a BIRAD zero, and the patient should be recalled to undergo further diagnostic workup. Uh, the, when the patient was recalled, uh, she and we looked at the tomosynthesis images. Uh, looking at one of the Im of the slices, there was a speculated uh, mass lesion in the left breast, in the lower inner quadrant of the left breast, which was biopsied and turned out to be an invasive duct carcinoma. Uh, this is another case. She had a, uh, a small nodular lesion in the right breast, which turned on ultrasound to be a small fibroadenoma. The rest of her breast showed fibrocystic mammary changes. While viewing the tomosynthesis images, unfortunately, she had a more serious lesion in the upper outer quadrant of the left of the right breast. Uh, there was a speculated outline mass lesion. This lesion was biopsied and turned out to be an invasive lobular carcinoma. Uh, this is another patient with an ACRC breast density. There is an evident mass lesion in the right breast. It's oblong in shape, 
circumscribed and on the tomosynthesis even it showed fat density and actually this was a hamartoma. Unfortunately, we, we uh, saw these uh, pathological looking uh, lymph nodes, so we had to go through the tomosynthesis uh, slices carefully. Going through the different slices, we picked this speculated mass lesion in the lower quadrant of the left breast. Uh, it was biopsied and it turned out to be uh, an invasive duct uh, carcinoma. Uh, this is another even less dense breast. It's classified as an ACRA and one of the colleagues misinterpreted this lesion as an intramammary lymph node. While looking on the tomosynthesis images, it was not an intramammary lymph node. It was a tiny speculated mass lesion in the right breast. As we said, the tomosynthesis helps us identify more lesions and it can also reduce the recall rate. Uh, this is one example. She's a 54 year old patient. She came for regular screening and she was going to be recalled because of this focal asymmetry in the right breast. On viewing the tomosynthesis images, there was no underlying lesions. It was simply overlapping breast parenchyma and she was not uh, recalled. Uh, and now we'll take a look on the, uh, on the tomosynthesis and its role in the diagnostic. Uh, uh, this is a, a female patient. She had a palpable paraareolar mass. And on her mammogram, we thought it was a probably benign uh, lesion. It was oblong, circumscribed. But when uh, seeing the magnified images of this lesion, we, we felt that there was a, a part of the lesion which was not well circumscribed as the other parts of the lesion. Uh, we uh, viewed the, uh, the tomosynthesis images and the picture was completely different. The, the lesion was not well circumscribed. It was a speculated lesion with micro calcific clusters within it. Uh, this was another 52 year old patient with a palpable mass in the left breast. Corresponding to the area of concern, she had this focal asymmetry in the CC view, which was indeterminate in the mediolateral oblique view. These are her tomosynthesis images, and now we can clearly see that there is an underlying speculated mass lesion. This was the ultrasound examination of the same patient. She was biopsied, and again, it turned out to be an invasive duct carcinoma. Uh, this is another case. She was going to be biopsied because of this focal asymmetry seen in the right uh, breast. Viewing her tomosynthesis images, it was not a true lesion. It was simply overlapping tissues, and there was no need to perform a biopsy. Uh, actually, tomosynthesis also helps us identify the actual tumor size. Maybe uh, some of you will tell me why perform a tomosynthesis with an evident carcinoma like this one seen in the right breast with speculated margins. I will tell you just to have a, a closer look uh, on this lesion. Uh, see the extension in the 2D mammogram and in the 3D mammogram. Definitely the extension is much uh, uh, more apparent on the 3D images. And uh, I think uh, actual, the, tumor, the actual tumor extension really counts in patient management. Uh, this is another case. She had a focal asymmetry in the right breast, which uh, on the tomosynthesis uh, images turned out to be a specula underlying speculated uh, mass lesion. Having a closer look at both the 2D and the 3D image, definitely we can identify a much wider extension on the 3D tomosynthesis images than on the 2D uh, images. Uh, tomosynthesis can also help us identify multiplicity of lesions. In this case, there was an evident carcinoma in the lower quadrant of the left breast. And while viewing the tomosynthesis images, in one of the cuts, we saw another a small speculated mass lesion. And just adjacent to it, there was another speculated mass lesion. So the diagnosis here changed from a unifocal carcinoma to a multicentric uh, carcinoma. Uh, this is another case. She had bilateral axillary uh, lymph node, uh, uh, axillary masses that were misinterpreted as bilateral axillary tail intramammary lymph nodes. On viewing the tomosynthesis images, the lesion on the right was an actual lymph node, while the lesion on the left was a speculated, a tiny invasive duct carcinoma. Uh, maybe after seeing these cases, uh, we might think that digital 3D digital tomosynthesis has solved all the problems of breast imaging. But actually, the best results in breast imaging are obtained from modalities which can combine enhanced morphology assessment together with giving us some functional information. 
And actually, tomosynthesis plays its main role in, in the enhancement of the morphology assessment, and it has no role to play in giving us any functional information. So again, going back to our slogan, necessity is the mother of all inventions, a new weapon had to be added in the war against breast cancer, and this time it was the contrast enhanced tomography, which was approved uh, by, uh, for sale by the Food and Drug Administration in the year 2010. Uh, the clinically proven results from studies performed in our department have shown that contrast mammography increases mammography sensitivity and specificity. Uh, more patients, uh, this means that more patients will be sent home avoiding further workup, or in other words, it will help reduce patient anxiety. And in the same time, less cancers will be missed, or in other words, we will have an enhanced diagnostic performance. Uh, the, uh, the principle of uh, contrast mammography lies behind the process of angiogenesis. As tumor cells uh, grow, they secrete pro-angiogenic factors that stimulate the proliferation of new blood vessels and new capillaries to supply the tumor cells with oxygen and nutrients. But these new blood vessels are not well formed and they allow uh, the, for the leakage of contrast material within uh, the surrounding uh, tumors. Uh, the technique of contrast enhanced mammography is a simple technique. It's like the contrast mammogram, but what's different is that we inject contrast in the anticubital vein two to three, uh, three to four minutes, uh, sorry, two to three minutes before uh, doing the exam. Uh, in the contrast enhanced mammography, we, we perform the four conventional views, but what's again different from the mammogram that in each view, we take a pair of a low energy image, which is similar exactly to the mammogram and the high energy image, which is sensitive to IUD. Then we combine both images together to get the recombined image in, in which the whole parenchyma is subtracted and we can only see uh, the lesions which have uptaken the contrast uh, medium. Uh, one advantage of contrast mammography is that we still have the low energy images in hand, which means that we can still assess for the presence or absence of microcalcification and we can characterize uh, these uh, calcifications. I'll show you one example where we used tomosynthesis and still we needed a contrast exam, a contrast enhanced mammogram to diagnose the patient. Uh, this patient, she had a palpable mass in the left breast and there was a carcinoma corresponding a speculated mass, which turned out to be an invasive duct carcinoma corresponding to the area of concern. Uh, these are her tomosynthesis images. The lesion became even more apparent, but unfortunately, during performing the ultrasound examination, we identified this tiny speculated mass lesion in the contralateral breast in the retro uh, region. We went back to the 2D mammogram and the tomosynthesis, but we were not sure whether this was the lesion or no. Actually, this was not the lesion, and the lesion was seen uh, very clearly when doing the contrast mammogram. It was here uh, in the retroareal region. And if even if we look on the contralateral breast in which the patient uh, uh, com uh, com uh, complained, it was not a single carcinoma. Actually, it was a multifocal uh, carcinoma and not a single carcinoma with a much wider extension than what appeared on the 2D and the 3D uh, images. In contrast mammography, up till now, we follow the ACR, MRI, morphology descriptors in order to characterize breast lesions. And therefore, we classify lesions into enhancing focus, which is a lesion which is less than five millimeter, uh, an enhancing mass. It is a three-dimensional lesion, space occupying, and enhancing numb mass, in which is an area which is non-space uh, occupying. And to characterize enhancing mass lesions, we should describe the shape of the lesion, which is either rounded, oval, or irregular. We should describe the margins of the lesion, which is either circumscribed, irregular, or speculated. And we should describe the internal enhancement pattern of lesions, which is either homogeneous, dark septations, heterogeneous, or rim. Going to the left side of the screen, we are mainly speaking of benign lesions. And to the right side, we are mainly speaking of malignant lesions. That's if, if I say I have an enhancing lesion, which is rounded, circumscribed, showing homogeneous enhancement, then this is most probably a, a benign lesion. While if I say I have an irregular speculated lesion, which shows heterogeneous or rim enhancement, this means I'm speaking of a malignant lesion. And to characterize non-mass uh, enhancement, we should describe the distribution, which is either focal, 
linear, segmental, regional, multiple regions or diffuse, and we should describe the internal enhancement characteristics, which is either homogeneous, heterogeneous, and clump, and cluster ring. And according to studies, uh, the linear, the segmental, and the regional, the heterogeneous and the clumped uh, patterns are were the most subjective of an underlying malignant pathology. Uh, in another study also performed in our department, uh, 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 assessing the impact of using the MRI morphology descriptors in characterizing breast lesions, we found that most non-enhancing lesions turn out to be benign, while most enhancing lesions turn out to be uh, malignant. And therefore, when we see a lesion on the mammogram and we perform uh, a contrast mammogram, if we can classify these lesions are either non-enhancing or enhancing. If we have non-enhancing lesions, then most probably these lesions are benign, and we only have a few non uh, malignant lesions which do not show contrast uptake, and these lesions are usually uh, the low-grade uh, DCIS. Well, if we have enhancing lesions, then most probably it is malignant lesions. And because we have few benign lesions which uh, can enhance, we should go back to the MRI morphology descriptors to differentiate between the benign and the malignant lesions. We will do some exercise together uh, as concerns mass lesion first. Uh, we have this case with a heterogeneously dense breast parenchyma. She had a pathological axillary lymph node, even maybe with extracapsular extension, and she had a focal asymmetry in the right breast. This was her contrast enhanced mammogram. She had an enhancing lesion without, in, within the breast. If you want to describe this lesion, we can say it's oval or rounded. It has non-circumscribed margins showing intense heterogeneous enhancement. We should look for associated features and there were actually a pathological enhancing axillary lymph nodes or features pointing to a malignant descriptors or to a malignant lesion and it, it is actually an invasive duct carcinoma. Uh, this is another case. She had multiple uh, uh, lesions within the left breast. Uh, and well, this is her contrast mammogram. If we look at the first lesion in the retroareolar space, it is non-enhancing and most probably it is a benign lesion and we will confirm this using the ultrasound examination. And we have the other lesion which showed contrast enhancement. And if we want to describe this lesion, we will say it is oval in shape. It, is, it has non-circumscribed margins. It shows homogeneous uh, pattern of contrast uptake. And when we look at these descriptors, there is an overlap between the benign and the malignant. So we have to look for other features. We have patholo additional pathological axillary lymph nodes. And looking close at the lesion and uh, magnifying the lesion, there were also group microcalcifications within the lesion. So the diagnosis here uh, is an invasive duct carcinoma. And this was her complementary ultrasound. These were the pathological axillary lymph nodes, the speculated mass lesion, and this was the oblong shape, non-enhancing fibroadenoma. Uh, this is another case. Uh, she had a lesion in the right upper outer quadrant, uh, and this was her contrast mammogram. If we want to describe this lesion, we can say that its shape, it, that the shape is oval in shape. Uh, it has circumscribed margins with dark internal septations, all features pointing to the diagnosis of a fibroadenoma. We do some exercise as concerned the numb mass enhancement. Uh, this is a lesion showing uh, anterior and posterior extension, taking a segmental distribution within the breast. Her contrast mammogram also showed segmental numb mass enhancement. If you want to describe this enhancement, we will say that this is an asymmetrical enhancement. It's not present in the other breast. Uh, the distribution is segmental, it is heterogeneous, all features again pointing to a malignant diagnosis, and this was a case of a lobular carcinoma. This is another case. She had a focal asymmetry in the retroareolar region of the right breast. This was her contrast mammogram. There was focal numb mass enhancement, and on the contralateral breast, she had enhancing foci, uh, or both lesions were turned out to be invasive duct carcinoma. Uh, this is another case. Uh, she had a focal asymmetry in the right breast with microcalcifications, group microcalcifications superimposed on this uh, focal asymmetry. Uh, this was the contrast mammogram of the same patient. She had, she, it showed a very faint contrast uptake, taking a segmental distribution uh, corresponding to the area of the microcalcification. 
And actually, this turned out to be a low-grade luminal A carcinoma, which is a, a sort of benign malignant uh, lesion. Uh, and uh, going back again to the best results in mammography, uh, we said that the best results are usually obtained from modalities which give us an enhanced morphology assessment together with functional information. And this functional information, as we saw with the contrast mammography, is obtained through injection of contrast uh, media. But as we saw in the last case, when we have lesions of low malignant potential, they might be hypovascular and they might not show good contrast uptake. And on the other hand, we might have vascular benign tumors, so th still there is an overlap between uh, the hypovascular malignant and the vascular benign tumors. And therefore, we should try to find uh, to get this functional information through another way, and this time it is uh, through the assessment of the metabolism of the cancer cell. And again, because necessity is the mother of all inventions, another weapon had to be added in the war against breast cancer, and this time it, it, is, it was the uh, molecular uh, breast imaging. And actually, the molecular breast imaging was approved uh, by the Food and Drug Administration ever since the year 1997. And several uh, radionuclides were used, but recently introduced uh, the positron emission mammography, which is known as uh, the PEM. Uh, the PEM is a specialized application of PET to visualize breast tissue metabolic changes with a much higher spatial resolution, thus allowing the visualization of smaller uh, tumors. Uh, as tumor cells proliferate and grow, specific metabolic pathways are activated to provide oxygen, glucose, and other nutrients which are essential for the growth of cancer cells. And one of these pathways is the anaerobic metabolism. Uh, normally, the glucose uh, enters the cells by, by, the, by using the glucose transfer in, uh, enzymes. When the glucose is inside the cell, it is subjected to the hexokinase enzyme, which turns it into glucose 6-phosphate. The glucose 6-phosphate becomes broken down using the process of glycolysis. In PEM, we use the same radionuclide as the PET, which is the 18F FDG, which is also uptaken in the, by the cells using the glucose transfer enzymes. Inside the cell, it, it is also subjected to the hexokinase, which changes into FDG, uh, changes it into FDG phosphate. But the FDG phosphate is not like the glucose 6-phosphate. It, it, be, it does not uh, break down using the process of glycolysis, uh, and it becomes entrapped inside the cells. And because of this entrapment, it gives us adequate time to image the radio tracer while, while within uh, the cell. The technique of PEM is, sim is uh, although it is not using ionizing radiation, but it is uh, similar to uh, the mammography. The patients are imaged in the upright position, uh, although we have some machines which use, we, in which the patient has to lie prone, but in the machine that we have in our department, we image the patient in the upright position, and the breast is gently stabilized between clear uh, compression plates. There are two opposing PET detectors that move in a linear manner within the air compression paddles to scan the breast for approximately 10 minutes. Uh, tomographic images of the breast are taken in the CC view, in the mediolateral oblique view, and in an extended axillary view, exactly like uh, the mammography. Or it is uh, nearly like the tomosynthesis rather than the mammography because in the PEM images are usually displaced as 12 slice tomographic images uh, to each uh, breast. Uh, and actually, the slice thickness uh, is equal to the compressed breast thickness divided by uh, 12. We can image the PEM images either in the gray scale or in the color uh, coded uh, scale. When we come to the assessment of PEM, we do a qualitative and a quantitative assessment. The qualitative assessment is exactly like what we do for MRI, in which we in, uh, classify lesions as enhancing and non enhancing. Then we assess for the intensity of uh, the radio tracer uptake, uh, and then we divide lesions into focal mass. Uh, focal ma focus mass and uh, numbness. Uh, and we look for associated features in order to try to classify them into benign or malignant. Then we do a quantitative assessment, which is similar to PET. In PEM, uh, we, use, uh, we measure the PEM uptake value, which is known as the PUV, and we measure the lesion to the background activity, which is known as the LTV. 
Uh, I'll show you some examples. This was a female patient with a palpable right breast mass. Looking at her mammogram, she had a global asymmetry of the right breast. Uh, we did an ultrasound examination and underlying malignant lesion was identified, but we were not sure whether it was a simple, a single lesion or multiple uh, lesions. Uh, this was her contrast mammogram, uh, which showed a, a mass lesion with surrounding more uh, tiny lesions, satellite lesions. While comparing this with what we see on the PEM, definitely it is much apparent on the PEM with an additional lesion which was not depicted on the contrast mammography. A biopsy was taken and it revealed a multifocal invasive duct uh, carcinoma. This is another 43-year-old female. She came for screening. This is her mammogram. She had uh, uh, micro group microcalcifications in the right upper outer quadrant and another benign looking lesion in the lower inner quadrant. Both lesions were biopsied and the upper lesion was a high grade DCIS and the lower lesion was a fibroadenoma. Uh, when the patient was uh, uh, reported in the breast tumor board, they, uh, the surgeons asked us to tell them the actual extent of the uh, DCIS so that they can choose between a conservative breast surgery or a mastectomy. We performed the contrast mammography, which failed to identify the actual tumor extent. Uh, while when doing the PEM, we can see easily see the true extent of the lesion, which even extended to involve the nipple areola complex. This was another case. She, she had a, a diffuse edema pattern of the right breast, her mammogram, her ultrasound were reported as diffuse edema pattern with no underlying masses. She performed MRI in some place outside the department uh, and they reported it as normal. While doing her a PEM, uh, a PEM uh, there was a deeply seated, a tiny mass lesion in the right breast, which was not apparent on other imaging modalities. And like anything in life, anything has its white side and its dark side. Uh, the we, uh, PEP has also disadvantages, and one of the major disadvantages that the standardized interpretive criteria are not yet well established and the interpretation is not yet incorporated into the BIRADS. There is also some overlap which still exists between benign lesions which can accumulate the radionuclei and some malignant lesions of very low metabolic activity, and again, these lesions are usually the low-grade DCIS and some lobular carcinomas. And again, the because necessity is the mother of all inventions, we come to our last station today, and that is adding artificial intelligence as a second pair of eyes in assessing uh, mammography. Uh, actually, in the past few years, we have witnessed tremendous scientific advances, advances in artificial intelligence, mainly aiming to improve, uh, to provide greater precision in screening tasks. Up till now, artificial intelligence is used as a second pair of eyes to radiologists in screening uh, purposes. Uh, while if we look at on, in another way, if we add quantitative assessment tools to deep learning models, definitely they will have a potential role to play in the diagnostic context as well as in the screening uh, context. Uh, this was a screening mammogram of a 58-year-old female. She had a subtle asymmetry in the left breast her tomosynthesis images showed an underlying speculated mass uh, lesion. Applying the artificial intelligence, it marked the same uh, area with the same lesion. Uh, maybe you would ask me, why should we? Why do we need the artificial intelligence if we already see the lesion on the tomosynthesis? But the answer should be that uh, why, per, why subject the patient to more irradiation while we can get the same results uh, with, uh, with less uh, irradiation to the patient? A biopsy was taken from this uh, mass lesion and it was an invasive duct carcinoma grade two. Uh, this was another patient. She had an incidentally discovered pathological axillary lymph node and her mammogram, her ultrasound were reported as normal. Uh, but when we applied the artificial intelligence, it marked an area with a high abnormality uh, score. Going back to the tomosynthesis images, uh, we could now see that there was one of the slices which showed architecture and distortion corresponding to this area, but this, uh, uh, these changes were very subtle and therefore they were missed on the ultrasound, on the mammogram, on, on the first viewing of the tomosynthesis image. This area was biopsied and revealed an invasive duct carcinoma grade two. Uh, this is another 57-year-old female. She had a speculated lesion uh, in the left breast 
and there was a subtle lesion in the upper in the outer breast quadrant we were not sure whether it was present or no on the mediolateral oblique view even on the tomosynthesis we could suge suggest that this is the lesion but we were not sure whether this was a true lesion or no applying the artificial intelligence it marked the two lesions with a high abnormality score and both were biopsied and it turned out to be a multicentric invasive duct carcinoma on the contrast uh, mammography, uh, it either even showed uh, more lesions uh, than uh, those identified on the tomosynthesis and on the artificial intelligence. Uh, this was the ultrasound examination. This was the speculated mass lesion in the lower breast quadrant. These were the upper outer uh, tiny uh, speculated lesions, and this was the ex pathological axillary lymph nodes. And by this, I come to the end of, the, of my lecture. And definitely in the last decade, we have witnessed an intense increasing, increase in volume in the volume of breast imaging techniques with the development of new technologies and the upgraded applications of already existing ones. Yet the question still remains with this rapid pace of new development, has the field of breast imaging exhausted itself or should we still await even higher technical evolution? And thank you.